best looks of 2022. We're going to get into it real quick. Sorry if my hair looks like a mess. Um, I have found that it is much harder to not style your hair when it's short, actually. Um, very disappointed to find that out, but it is unfortunately the life I live now. The books I have physically are in that stack right there. I don't know if you can see it. I think you can see it, but I am unsure. Um, I do have one book I own physically that is not on there. Um, I can't find it. I'm looking around. Um, I think it got misplaced in the transfer from, uh, I moved my shelf. So, I think it got misplaced when I was doing that. Um, first we're going to do my honorable mentions, which are, not in any particular order, The Lost Words by Robert McFarland, Small Spaces by Catherine Arden, Canadian Store Woman by Sayaka Maratha, Cold by Mariko Tamaka, We Ride Upon Sticks by Quan Berry, Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel, Slug and Other Stories by Megan Milks, and The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filial. The book that is missing from this lovely stack is going to be the one we start off with. And that is Men, Women, and Chainsaws by Carol J. Clover. This is a foundational piece of feminist literary criticism for I'm gonna call it a literary criticism. This does this is directly about movies, like it's film critique, so it's film criticism and not literary criticism, but I think um I think general things like the content critiques rather than the um form critiques are largely the same. I think they're shared a lot of the time. Work of film criticism. I read it for a class, um, got a 90 on the term paper I wrote it for, which is amazing, I thought the paper was bad, but this is kind of a foundational work in film criticism. It is four parts. The first part is the part that most people are going to know about, and it's the part that, um, created, I believe, the term The Final Girl. The edition I read did have a long longer introduction and forward that kind of reflected on the uh, response to the book in the year since it came out. So the first part is about the final girl, the second part is about um, possession stories, the third part is about rape revenge films, and the uh, fourth part is about, um, so this one applies only to film, but it's about um, if a point of view shot uh, always or necessarily refers to um, audience identification. Like, if a point of view shot means you are supposed to identify with what is, uh, what perspective you're getting. I, so in addition to the class I took that I read the book for, this book did a lot to open my eyes to the reality of film, I guess. Um, not the reality of it, but, like, the narrative and thematic depth that film can have. Because that was not a language I knew. Um, appreciating film in a way that this book um, encourages you to do was not something I knew. Um, I could do it with literature because I took literature classes because I studied this. Because I built it up and up and up. But... Um, no one ever gave me that same foundation to work with when it came to film, and the film critique I had seen was largely, um, literary critique repackaged, and I found it that did not really capture what I was looking for, so this more academic, um, work that is clear in what it's trying to do was really helpful to me, and I enjoyed the conversations that it had, and the ways in which it helped me build my own draw off of, essentially. 
Next we have Devil's Lake by Sarah M. Sala. I think this is technically a reread, but I do not remember reading it the first time, or I remember reading it the first time, and I remember not liking it. And I really liked it this time. So I think I'm confused. I think the fact that I had a completely different reading experience in 2022 compared to the reading experience I had with this book in 2021. Um, I think I can count it on this list. I think I can do it. This is poetry. It was n nominated for the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Poetry, if my memory serves me. It is the aspect of lesbianism that I often actually see captured, but it's not something that non-lesbians know a lot about. Like, it's not something that I see discussed outside the community a lot, and that is just the feeling that you are prey and the ways that um, lesbians, and particularly butch women in particular, can relate to this form of masculinity. Um, that is, it is, they are drawn to this masculinity as children and then it is taken away from them. We're just gonna read it in full. When I was a boy, it was always summer. We brandished unripe chests to launch stunt bikes over gaping foundations. Our dirty fingers tended past thorns to wolf blackberries from the shade of weeping willows. Sequin snakes curled towards us in the lake like nightmares we procrastinated with rocks. A Reese's monitor called, keep your coats on unless you're wearing an undershort shirt. Suddenly it was spring. A boy presumed sameness to peer down my sweater. I first started the boy, then I became a rosebud. I did. Every time I see that particular experience um, mimicked on page, it just really means a lot to me to see. Um, I'm going to talk about the first book that I don't own physically. I do own the audiobook version of this, and that is Dog Flowers by Daniel Geller. It is also the last known fiction that I have on this list. Um, this is a memoir written by a Danae woman who is grieving the loss of an absentee mother and also um, through that grief recon reconnecting with the Danae heritage that her mother abandoned. Um, it's not that long, um, under 300 pages, and it just um, is our, mate, our author, Danielle Geller, unpacking her mother's stuff and unpacking the loss, and then going through her childhood through the lens of this loss and what brought her to this loss and how she acted leading up to it and in the days and years following it. So it's just something about a dysfunctional family memoir that is really, really near and dear to my heart. Um, it was just a very raw look at someone who is trying to be better than the people that raised them in trying to um, escape cycles on their own, but also not to leave their family behind while they break those cycles, and I appreciated it a lot for that aspect. I'm gonna knock out the two contemporaries on this list. The first of what being with Teeth by Kristen Arnett. This is the, f oh, not the follow-up, but it is the second novel of, by the author who wrote Mostly Dead Things, um, which is one of my all-time favorite books. I haven't reread it recently, but I very much think I should, but this follows a woman, Sam, and um, her and her wife have decided to do IVF to have a child with um, Sam's egg. The child is named Samuel, um, after, after Sam, and it just follows her being a bad mom. It just follows the ways in which she is really not cut out for motherhood, the many ways she failed, and it offers a very interesting perspective to it all, because she does not necessarily see the issues in the way she's acting, in how she chooses to do things, but it is 
very clear to the reader um, what mistakes she's making, how she's making them, and how this keeps escalating and escalating um, until we get to the end of the book. Her perception of the, her son, Samuel, is um, Samson. His name's Samson, not Samuel. Sorry. Samson. Is something that you cannot be sure of. Um, she's very much an unreliable narrator, and it made this a very intriguing and complicated read, and I had a, a lot of fun unpacking that. Okay, I Dreaming by Soto Gonzalez. This is another family drama. It follows a main character, Olga, who is a wedding planner in New York City. Um... And she basically tries to exist in um, spaces that are hostile to her as a Puerto Rican non-white woman. It also spends some time with her brother, who is a congressman um, for New York. We get a good look at Olga's entire life, just everything that happened in her life. Her complicated relationship with her father, who eventually died of age-related complications due to uh, drug use, her mother's abandonment of her and her brother, just the very sticky ways that family and your parents affect you well into adulthood. And I appreciate uh, the book a lot for what it did in that regard. There are also some moments in this book that lean almost thrillerish. Like, it never quite gets there, but um, there are some moments in the book that will make you go, you know, this is, this feels a little out of place for contemporary. It does ultimately make sense genreize for this book because it does skew literary fiction. I think it might technically be literary fiction. <laughs> Next, I'm going to talk about the two short well the yeah the two short story collections on this list. Life Ceremony by Sayaka Murata and Out There by Kate Book. Starting with Life Ceremony. Um, both of these short story collections deal with, um, in a lot of these, these short stories, the way in which the body functions. Um, Out There by Kate Book takes a more focused um, lens of misogyny and these stories are all, in one way or another, inspired by some aspect of misogyny, internalized or externalized misogyny, via patriarchy that women experience, and that just resonated a lot with me. Um, my favorite short story in that collection was, I cannot remember the name of it to save my life, but it was about the one where uh, the main character's bones liquefy at night, and she's in a treatment center with other people who are um, facing this clu um, this condition, and she ends up becoming a bit of an, uh, a not like other girls girl. Just throughout this all, it engaged me, and it was weird, and I don't need stuff to be subtle, personally. Um, it is not a subtle book. I think the metaphor is right there. I think it's in your face, and I think that's fun sometimes. I think we should just let metaphor be in your face sometimes. It's great. It's great, I liked it. Life Ceremony is much more focused on the loner than the outcasts and the alienation of one person from society rather than um, a greater societal critique based on an axis of oppression. Um, at least that's my reading of it. It is just 12 stories that are about people that are in one way or another outside of the society that they live in and sometimes those societies are weird man <music> then we have bestiary this is a another family saga but it is not a contemporary i would say it is more mythological in scope um there are elements of folklore and mythology that are part of these stories, they they are real in this world, and they are not 
really questioned by the characters. Like, the main character has a tail. She just has a tail. It's fun. Um, but we follow three different generations of a family. Um, grandmother, mother, and daughter. Um, they might have names. I don't think they have names, though. <laughs> I could be wrong, though. I do have not the best memory. But... We just follow these women, and we follow their lives, and we get a look at, cult, uh, um, it's just the hardship of their lives, and the ways that trauma is passed down, and the ways that cycles of abuse continue, and I enjoyed that a lot, and the use of folklore in this book, um, the way that multiple family members are folkloric in nature, um, they are made into folklore in that weird stuff happens to them. Um, I think it was just a very, very interesting um, narrative device because a lot of the time we are to view these things as metaphoric and outside the text they are metaphoric. But these are just presented as normal aspects of life, like these folklores, like this woman who turned her daughters into fish. Um, that's just in the part of the book that just happened in this otherwise normal world, for lack of a better word. And I found that to be an amazing narrative choice to go with. And finally, we have my favorite book of the year, which was in the Goodreads Choice Awards sci-fi nominees. It is not, it, it is sci-fi adjacent, but this is a horror book, Goodreads. Yeah. But this was horror, it is not sci-fi. Um, it has sci-fi elements, but the primary genre here is horror. It follows a member of the Institute. Um, more accurately, it follows a hive mind known as the Institute and one branch of that hive mind going to the mountains of it just is far north going to the mountains in the far north are oh, there's the name i know the name i read a paper on this like i should know the name um they go to the far north in order to investigate the death of one of their previous hosts it is Perhaps, perhaps, definitely, definitely my favorite in this new line of spore horror. I, I someone referred to it um as spore punk. Uh, I don't know if it was this book in particular, but this genre as spore punk, and I think I'm gonna go with it. In this book deals a lot with identity and how identity and how gender are constructed and the conversations and the way that goes about this are ideal for me. Um, I listened to this book primarily on audio while I was walking around Pittsburgh um, to get, what did I get? Oh, I got a re-readable. I was walking around Pittsburgh to get up a readable. It was just such an amazing and fascinating book. I could not put it down. I had to keep listening to it. When I wasn't listening to it, I was thinking about it. And it just handled the conversations so masterfully. And the metaphor here... I don't know. I don't think it's subtle. I don't think the metaphor is subtle. It might be subtle, though, um, especially if you're reading it physically. So one reason I did like this book so much is because of the audiobook. The audiobook is narrated by Abigail Thorne, and if you know this book, and if you know the themes of this book, and if you know who Abigail Thorne is, it adds a level of metatextuality to it that really aided in my reading of the story and helped me form my um, conclusion about this book, and it's 
just a book that takes identity and takes gender and views it through a horror lens that filters it through fungus and parasitic infections is always going to work well for me. Um, I just, I highly recommend this book. I know it's not going to be for everyone, um, but if you're in the market for a more literary, not literary, but a horror that skews sci-fi that where the scientific components are front and center in the book, but it's still horror, I recommend this. Um, it's also a highly atmospheric book. Um, maybe it's because I was walking around Pittsburgh without a winter coat going to get a burrito bowl, but I was, I felt cold reading this book. The way the landscape and the, the way the landscape and the weather are described and the picture that creates as a whole, um, it was incredibly masterfully done and I highly recommend this to anyone.